Olá, gente. Bem-vindos a mais um episódio das entrevistas do Arise. Eu sou o Vinícius Marino e hoje nós temos aqui um convidado muito especial, o Jeremiah McCall, alguém que tem uma experiência vastíssima é, nos estudos sobre videogames históricos. Jeremiah McCall ele é um romanista de formação, mas ele tem se especializado e publicado há vários anos sobre a intersecção entre educação e videogames. E é sobre isso, entre outras coisas, que nós vamos falar aqui hoje. Jeremiah, thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to meet you face to face, even though it, it, it's in these circumstances. But uh, I'll, I'll take so this <laughs> over nothing. I, I'm very glad to meet you all. This is, this is a fun thing to do. Thank you. Absolutely. And well, let's start by the beginning. Tell us a little, a little bit about yourself. You have a lot of experience with games. How did you start working with, with the median? And does it have any relation to, with your career as an educator or as a historian? So, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think part of it is understanding sort of my background with, with games just as a hobbyist. Um, I've been loving computer games since, I mean, I, I, I'm old enough so that I had the original Atari 2600 uh, uh, system. So 1980 or 1978 or something like that. Um, and so that was really, I, that's kind of an important part I bring to this, just loving games. I also, when I think back on my social studies education myself in, in middle school and things like that, um, The, the, the few things that stuck with me were the simulation games that I played. I remember those very well when I don't necessarily remember anything else about the content of the classes. Um, so I, I sort of started with that very game positive background. And then from there, I was a teaching assistant while I was getting my PhD in Roman history um, at Ohio State. And um, as, as you know, there are great limits to lecture, right? There is, only so, there is only so much enthusiasm one can muster just by kind of talking through things. And most people's PhD experiences are, um, I think, are, okay, you've done your exams. Here's a classroom. We're not going to tell you anything else. Good luck. So, so for me, I wanted to really think about whether there might be um, some some interactive activities, I, uh, sort of physical experiences. I um, I played with this idea of could I do sort of a medieval classic feudalism, lords and vassals swearing allegiances to each other in in a class. Um, and then the one, the only one that really stuck actually from that college teaching period is I would have my kids line up like a Greek phalanx and they would do marching exercises to see the kind of uh, unity was that was needed. Um, well, so as it turned out, I ended up going into high school teaching. Turns out that's my that's my real passion, um, and it became even more important, I think, to come up with ways to help students visualize, to historically imagine things. Um, I designed a couple of physical games for an ancient history course I had taught, um, and, and so this is about this is around about 2000, 2002. Then I ended up coming to the school I'm at now, Cincinnati Country Day School, and I had the great fortune um, to have a school that has a lot of, it's a laptop school, so every child has a laptop, and we've got a, a sort of core system that we're all using. And so from there, I started experimenting with, with games, um, like that weren't just physical games, um, which had, had been sort of what I'd used. Um, and so... I experimented a little, and somewhere around 2005, I, I uh, gave my first historical simulations course to my seniors, senior elected, so um, uh, 17, 18 year olds. Um, Kurt Squire found me, who's who's a researcher in games and learning at the or well, he was at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He's at UC Irvine now, um, and he had me come out to LA and speak at MIT's Education Arcade on using civilization as a history teacher. And so it became abundantly clear to me really, really quickly that this was something that people were interested in but not doing. So this this is about 15 years ago. Um, So from there, um, I ended up writing the book. I wrote Gaming the Past, which is sort of the book on pedagogy and, and using video games in history classes. Uh, started the website um, and sort of went from there. Um, so that's how I kind of came to this uh, uh, field. What makes a good game a good fit for learning and classroom use? What are some things to avoid? You know, Socrates was supposed to have said uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, the idea, right, that things should be subjected to scrutiny and analyzed and understood. Um, 
And I sort of suggest that from, a, from an educational standpoint, the unexamined game is not worth playing. As a player, you don't have to think about games, but education, uh, I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but education is about slowing people down in places and ways that they don't want to slow down. Slow down and read this, slow down and think about this, slow down and let's talk about this. So for me, the type of game you use in a history uh, education context doesn't matter as much as the debate that you foster with it. Um, so there are things there are things certainly to consider length of the game. Um, I have been using civilization with 14 year olds for about 15 years, and it is a long, long game. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of structure to get kids to use that. Um, another game like uh, Political Machines, uh, a, a good one here, or uh, which is it's presidential election uh, mechanics and things like that. There are simple, shorter games um, that often you can use a lot more effectively in a class. So that's certainly an issue. Um, I guess what I would say is debate discuss, need to set up a learning experience with the game. So that involves um, teaching kids how to play. One of the things that I think we kind of forget is we assume that everybody that's under the age of 18 is a great video gamer and knows how to play everything. And that's not true with a lot of the games we're using. So support them in learning to play, teach them how to play, reflect and debrief, make sure that you're discussing um, um, what's going on in the game and thinking about whether it's accurate and whether it's not. For me, I want my students to be able to use historical evidence and think about what can be said about the past and what can't be. So the type of game I'm using doesn't matter so much as having those sort of supports around it of teaching students to play, uh, making sure there are lots of learn, uh, debriefing experiences um, and room to critique. For us, our tips are gold because we are creating games right now and it's amazing <laughs> yeah oh absolutely and i think and i think that uh, i mean what i would do as as a, a game designer i certainly try to do this as a teacher is I, I i you know when i when i've got the game i stop and think and say okay well what what could people read as a source to check this what could they read um, um to give them some sort of sense of where the game works and where it doesn't because no game is going to mo i mean well okay stepping back for a second first of all no history is going to model the past as it actually happened right it's gone we don't have it Right. So if texts themselves, right, and our lessons and our lectures, if they're not going to recapture the past, a game's certainly not going to either. So the question is then, what can I do to, to critique it? So yeah, I would be thinking about those places. What sources could you give people to look at? What kind of readings or even class lectures might you use to serve as an evidence check on the game? You, you mentioned that uh, you, you shouldn't take for granted that teenagers and kids would necessarily uh, like and want to play a game. Do you have any experiences where the class actually didn't want to play a game or they didn't really take to whatever you chose? Yes, absolutely. I think um, 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 it's never everybody. There's always some kids who think it's the most amazing thing. And I, I, most of all, as, 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 a, as a teacher and a researcher and a historian, I am very interested in practical applications. And so what I found practically is I go into a class and the first thing I learned, rule number one is do not tell your children they'll have fun playing the game. And the reason why you don't tell them that they're having fun playing the game, well, there's two reasons. One, fun is not the same thing as educationally viable. We, we want people to be interested in our teaching and learning. I want them to have engaging learning experiences. But is it fun is not the first question that, that we should ask. The other thing is it all depends on your, on your point of view. Uh, fun compared to what? Is playing a game as fun as going out on a date to the movies, as fun as going off on a camping trip? I don't know, it depends. So one of the, the first things I started working with with kids is seeing that kids are in lots of different places and they should it should be a valuable exercise regardless of whether they like games or not and so for me it becomes more about what kind of systems thinking can i encourage how can they look at the game systems and think about like player choice in those systems and maybe historical agents choice within systems um the other thing is that's where that kind of supporting people to learn is really really important 
Um, again, Civilization, I mean, that's a beast. What a huge game. And there are people who are, are not going to grasp all parts of it. And there's some people who are going to be off on their own, and you don't even need to help them at all. And so for me, the, the, the sort of goal is to remind people, this is why we're looking at this. We want to study some systems. We want to look at some features of ancient civilizations, for example, but we're not testing you on mastering the game. We're not testing you on your ability to actually get a good score or things like that. You have designed a tabletop game based on your research on Roman history. Could you tell us about the project, please? Sure. So one of the things that um, I'm so fortunate um, to have as, as a high school history teacher um, is I get to play around in a lot of different fields. I'm not limited to sort of only one thing that that I can do. Um, I so so I teach a Roman Rep uh, Roman Republic course. Um, that's my specialty is aristocratic politics in, in the Republic and uh, and military systems and culture. Um, and it was it was my quest to come up with a good Roman politics game. It seemed to me years ago, back when I was finishing my grad work, it seems to me today that other than the fact that Romans took very seriously their competitions over offices and honors, it was still very much a game in the sense of it was a competitive uh, 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 arena uh, atmosphere. There were rules that had to be followed um, and they kept score about who was winning and who was losing. Um, so I kept thinking there was a game in that. And for the longest time, I couldn't make it work. And the reason I couldn't make it work is I was determined to make it historically accurate. Not historically detailed necessarily, but historically accurate. And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't come up with anything that seemed like an actual game experience with rules and mechanisms that was, was uh, sort of faithful to the history. Then I started to play around with game design and learn the craft of game design for just as a hobbyist. And what I found was I, I, I sort of took the skills I got from learning uh, board, tabletop game design. And I said to myself, OK, this year, I forget what year it was, like 2017 or something. This year, you're going to make a game on the Roman Republic for the seniors in, the, in your Roman Republic class. And it may not be historically accurate, but it is going to be a game and it's going to be on that content. So what is it that you need to design? And so what that did is stripped away all the sort of extra historical detail. And I got myself down to, OK, basically, you have a bunch of people competing. What are they competing for? Elections. How do they compete? By saying that they're better than the other people. What do they do when they win an election? They command an army and hope they get a little more glory from that. And then they all compete again. And so once I kind of stripped it down to its fundamental models, um, it started working really well. So um, so this game, I, I call it uh, Res Publica, it's the, or Res Publica, the uh, Latin for Republic for the Romans. Um, it's basically a sort of competitive social situation where each student represents four or five different senators and they have cards representing the senators and then they have a series of political cards they can play on each other to increase one. So, so everything's measured in terms of dignity. They all have dignity points. And based on your dignity points, that's kind of your score you get a certain number of actions in a turn. And so what you're doing with those actions is trying to make yourself look good, trying to make other Roman politicians not look good, um, competing for these sort of offices and honors. Um, and um, it's worked really well. Uh, it, it, there, is, there is a magic about board games. I don't use a lot of board games, but when you can get kids in face-to-face -face playing board games, there's a real power of social dynamics there that you can't always get with a video game. Um, and, and the other thing is, it's just been invaluable. This work I've done has been invaluable for me in my research and game studies because it gets me thinking like a designer. And I know full well that it is not a simple thing or even a doable thing to say, I'm going to take history and map it perfect, you know, perfectly into a game. So that really has helped me kind of build my understanding in those areas. Well, uh, I, I got a question that I'm that I'm doing off the cuff here a little bit because sure. uh, since since I've been working with Arise developing educational games, I have you've talked a little bit about 
people having the engage the students having the engagement into reading and and going to the information and how do we with your experience on games and education and within of course history but it we can get into a broad spectrum here as well uh, how can we measure not measure the the not the, the reach of the video games in terms of giving the knowledge out there i know you talked a little bit about your intentions with it but as your experience on game with games and all how can and developing games with that set purpose with that purpose how do we how do us as developers can right have that measure and of course if we can tweak and tweak the game into making be more effective as well that's a great question um i i think there's kind of two different ways that you can use a game in like you said in history but really in any field or subject um if it's going to be uh educational one is if it's you know what you might call a didactic game i want this game to teach basic information about a subject um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. That works sometimes, um, but um, you may be aware in the 80s, they had this thing called edutainment, which was this idea of sort of software that basically just drilled students on memorization of details and that gameplay and those details didn't really mesh well together. So like math blasters, I think you solved math problems. Um, and in between the math problems, you got to do a little shoot 'em up racing game and it had nothing to do with the math problems. So I guess what I would say in those games where you're wanting to get some content across, I would say integrate it into your gameplay. That, that would be number one, um, is make the material the stuff that, that, that they're playing with. Um, I, I am completely out of my realm of knowledge when it comes to teaching mathematics and physics, but I've always suggested to my math and physics teacher friends that if they had a game where both teams had to calculate the formulas to have a catapult drop a rock on the other side, okay, in real time, they would suddenly do a really good job learning how to do those calculations and things like that. Um, if somebody really wants to learn how to use um, a, a, a second language, drop them in a situation where they really needed to be able to communicate their way out. So I guess that's what I would say is, is if you're going for sort of straight knowledge, reten knowledge retention, build the knowledge into the game. For me though, and I think it's true of a lot of educators, it's certainly true for a lot of history educators, for me, that doesn't concern me as much because I'm not interested in them getting the discrete sort of facts from the game. I, I, I'm not interested in them getting anything that they don't go back to and say, is this accurate or not? And so for me, a, a game that does a reasonable job, partial job of representing the past. So, um, Oh, let's see, I'm gonna use, oh, you know what? I'm gonna use East India Company. This is an old one that got, uh, it hasn't been around for a while. It was about 15 years ago, a video game where you got to form an East Indian company. You were one of the European powers and you set up this company. This is a video game and proceeded to engage in all this trade. And basically the the um, goods of South India and, and China were worth a lot in Europe, right? And the European goods were not worth so much in, in uh, China and South India. So they had to bring in silver and, and things like that. And you take a game like that and you go, okay, that basic model, that's fine. I don't mind if, I don't mind having them sort of think about that. After that though, you start to talk about, well, what doesn't it show? Well, it doesn't show the systematic exploitation of, of the peoples in these areas and it doesn't show the brutality and there's lots of things it doesn't show. And I'm okay with that as long as you as the teacher make sure that students know that those are realities. Um, one of the things I'm working with for my senior elective this year, I, I teach an interactive history course uh, in the fall. Um, the last year or two, um, while I've been designing that class, I've found such a, such a, and sorry if I'm late to the, late to the party, but such a wealth of material on uh, colonialism in games. And it's just clearly such a fascinating area where we have all of these colonialist assumptions that are built into the very genre of 
conquer and conquest and 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 exploitation and stuff like that. So um, so if you're going on that side, okay, if you're not going with just sort of knowledge retention, if you're going with with critique, I would say the things that you need most of all are models, clear models in the game, the ability for people to understand cause and effect in the game, okay? And you need to have good resources. Um, and that's often the job of a teacher, partner with a teacher and ask a teacher, what resources could we use um, um, to study this phenomenon? There's a, there's a series of games, uh, I think it's WGBH in Boston, Boston Public Television up in, in Massachusetts. They made this series of games. You can still see them. They're called uh, Mission U.S. So the word mission and U U.S. like United States. And it's a series of historical role playing games that were designed. One of the things they did is they talked to educators and they found all these great primary sources that allowed you to read and see what you thought about the game. And that's the kind of dialogue that I think is the most meaningful. Uh Moving forward, you have worked extensively with Twine, both creating your stories and using with your students. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with text-based games? What makes them so special? Right now, most of my text-based game work is with Twine and with choice-based text games. Um, I am old enough that the original sort of Infocom adventures in the early 80s were games that I played. And I loved them, but I was horrible at them because I could never solve the puzzles and I never knew what it was the designer wanted. But I always, the, the feeling of typing in a noun verb uh, pair and having it actually be understood by the machine, it was exhilarating. I just thought that was the greatest experience. So even though I could only play the games for about half an hour, I loved my, my, my sort of little bit. So I wanted to do, have my students do game design. One of the things that I became very aware of, which I, I, I'm sure you all are as game designers, is if you really want to learn the history of a place, figure out how to make a game. And then you'll have to learn so much to be able to you know, faithfully represent this. So pretty early on as, as a teacher, so this is my 21st year in high school teaching, pretty early on, I thought, I want my students making games. I want them to have to research it and come up with these games. Well, so what do you do? Physical games are the, are the easiest option and I've gone with those. But what I really wanted was some way for them to make digital games for portability, for being able to share them, for it being a skill set that they're likely to need out in the world working with computers. And so from there, okay, you want your students to build their own games. What do you use? Well, 15 years ago, um, Game Maker might have been out, but there weren't many things like it. And even with Game Maker, it wasn't easy enough to have kids in a history class design these games. And even today, there are wonderful game makers like Construct and, and Game Maker and stuff like that. But if you have a history class, you can't really justify the amount of time needed to teach that um, in detail. So I ran across text games. And the first games I had students design were parser-based with the, with the noun verb pairs and stuff. And I used Inform. Um, in Form 7, which is still a tool that's around for people to do that. And what I found was that games that are based on puzzles, right? So you type in go west and, the and then it tells you what the character did and you type in, you know, take lamp and it tells you what's happening when he's holding the lamp or she, they're holding the lamp. Um, those type of puzzle games aren't really a great model for doing historical simulation games. Um, there's certain things you can do with them. I've kind of, someday maybe I'll go back and kind of explore this a little more. But for your, let's, let's have you be a Roman woman who is, uh, you know, trying to, to sort of navigate the politics of having a husband who's going to be emperor or something like that, okay? Well, that's not something that really fits into, you know, sort of puzzle mechanics very well. Um, suppose you're a farmer and you're trying to, you know, sort of plant crops and things like that. Well, that's not really going to translate very well into a puzzle game. So then, but I still thought it was worthwhile. But then I came upon Twine, probably round about the transition to Twine 2. Um, and 
what what has occurred to me is this is a perfect well maybe not but a perfect <laughs> i want to say perfect don't i this is a incredibly good if not perfect medium for students to research and design games because what it mixes is choices and the ability to make interactive choices and see their effects with the precision of text and text has great advantages and also great weaknesses as a medium for representing the past games have their have their own and if we were if we were going to be really simplistic right we'd say texts uh one of the downsides is that they're very linear and and they're fixed they sort of they are what they are and they stay that way but on the other hand they're very precise games on the other hand are not fixed and they're not necessarily linear but they're also not very precise at communicating things so using Twine allows um, students to design, allows me to create these projects where students research a historical figure and then design a game where that figure has to go through a series of historical goals. So um, in the ancient world, it's always political leaders or mostly because we don't have enough information, but you're Hatshepsut, a you know, ruler in Egypt, and you wanna be a powerful ruler. Um, and so what decisions might you make? And adding to the fact that it's already difficult to be a pharaoh in Egypt, you're a woman and it traditionally women weren't often pharaohs in ancient Egypt. So how do you make the choices that are necessary to be an effective ruler? You can do that in a twine game. Um, so I've been playing around with that um, a lot. Um, I, guess, I guess I should probably mention, at the same time, I also experiment as a researcher on whether we as scholars could make twine texts, could make choice-based texts to present academic work. There's a, there's a little bit of background in this, but basically the idea, could you take the ability of text games with the ability to do footnotes, the ability to do citations, the ability to do hyperlinks, the ability to show your research in all these ways, but make your research come out in the form of an agent in space making choices. Um, so I have a project called Path of Honors that I've been working on for four years, maybe, where I'm trying to do a, a historically reasonable account of a young person going through an aristocratic career in the Republic. And I'm playing with how would you put footnotes in there? And what kind of information do you make clear to the readers? Because you're trying to present an academic argument, not just a, um, uh, not just a game. Um, so that's an area that I've, I've been exploring a lot. And I think as long as computers continue to have a challenge, as long as designing computer games continues to be challenging, so challenging that you need to spend a lot of time on it, which you do, text-based games are going to be the way to really get people whose focus is on history or whose focus is on English or whose focus is on other things. Um, um, to get to make games too. So I think it's a really powerful tool. One of your most well-known contributions to historical game studies is the historical problem space. Could you tell us how you elaborate this framework and how it has evolved in the years? Sure. So um, I started writing with a group of historians historians on a project called Play the Past that's still around. And it's, it's, a, it's a really nice website with lots of essays on, on uh, historical games. And that was sort of the first place where I really got to sort of bounce around ideas with other historians working on games. And I noticed that, and this may seem obvious, but, um, we were all, it was new, <laughs> 10 years ago it was new. Um, Figuring out what's accurate and what's not accurate in a game, right, seems to be a pretty central task for historians uh, uh, looking at games. And one day it sort of struck me, and I believe the context was, it was discussions about, I believe it was about the game colonization, Sid Meier's colonization. And I think maybe how slavery was portrayed in the game, I can't remember exactly. But there were all these really interesting debates about the ways that different historical figures were portrayed in the games. And it sort of clicked for me that if you really want to answer the question, why does a certain game portray history in a certain way, you need to understand the game holistically. Um, and, and so what, I, what I've kind of developed is this idea that games present the past like historical problem spaces. 
And that seems really fancy, but it's really not. Basically, games put you in the place of some kind of player agent. So you could be a whole civilization, you could be one person trying to do something, uh, you know, any number of things. But you are an agent trying to solve goals that are assigned to you by the developers. And those goals and that player are in a game space, a game world. So, you know, civilization, that's a map of the world. Uh, Assassin's Creed, that's a map of a city. Um, but you're in some kind of expression of a game world. So you as the player have these goals set for you, and it's within a game world that you operate. And, and so, the, I mean, one thing that comes up very often is, well, you don't have to play according to the rules that have been set for you. Yeah, that, that's true. You don't have to chase the goals that the designers have, have set for you. but the historical problem space framework is meant to get people looking at what designers are going for. So yeah, absolutely. You can play any way you want, but at the end of the day, the game designers, right? Game design historians, they're doing history in their own, uh, in their own right, said, here's the world. This is who you are. This is what your goals are. Everything else in the game, I call game world elements. And it seems to me um, that game world elements either help you or get in your way. And that as a player, you have this uh, instrumental view of things in, in the world. Um, and, and that can be very problematic. I mean, right? You can, you can have uh, human beings being represented in the game, but if they're not the player agent, then they are either part of the goal, in the way, or helping out. And so as a player, you form these strategies to try and achieve the goals uh, and take advantage of the things that help you and ignore or go around the things that you know limit you to achieve that so if you take all that what i'm arguing with the historical problem space framework is that's how so here's the thing there are experimental games out there that could do whatever they want right you can create a video game that just makes the color blue on the screen and makes random noises and you can say that's my historical game about uh, the 2020 presidential election. We're getting there. Uh, so, uh, but, okay, so you could do that, right? Or you could make a game and have a flower in the middle and press on it. And this could be about Louis XIV palaces or whatever. Okay. So it could be done. But in my experience, definitely with commercial games, and it seems to be most games that are sort of spread around or attempting to be commercial, they are problem spaces. Every historical game I know of, certainly every marketed historical game, presents the past this way. So think about what that means. What that means is every game presents the past as a series of agents pursuing goals competitively in a world that has contained them, that has stuff in it that either helps them or hinders them. Now, if you're a if you're trying to get a degree in nursing to become a terrific to become a terrific nurse maybe your life works like that sometimes maybe you have a goal and there's ways that you're trying to achieve your goal and you go towards it if you're a military commander that's an obvious one maybe that that works for it if you're a peasant trying to make enough produce to be able to survive maybe parts of your life are a goal in a space with stuff that helps you or hinders you but that's not how the whole world works. I mean, most. I mean, we, I mean, like most of the time, we don't know what our goals are for a different day, or a given moment, and they're conflicting and all sorts of messiness. The historical problem space approach is meant to do two things. It's it's meant to sort of let people sort of see that this is how games present it. Be aware of the limits of this presentation, but then if you want to know why does um, a certain game present things a certain way look at the whole context of the space um, and i guess the last thing i should add and so, so what i've done to develop this is i've been writing a series on play the past uh recently um that i encourage you to check out uh it's i'm i think i've just done the first uh installment and i'm kind of going back to these ideas i talked about eight or ten years ago and trying to really kind of go through carefully and think through in kind of a public interactive way um this framework and and um 
how it's used. One of the big things, for example, that I've come to realize a lot more over time is that genre is very, very important in determining how a game portrays the past. Um, think about Age of Empires. They came up with a definitive edition of Age of Empires 1 and 2 last year, I think. If you listen to Bruce Shelley, one of the designers, he's on a podcast at one point, and he says Age of Empires was supposed to be a civilization meets uh, World of Warcraft and Command and Conquer, which were the two big other real-time strategy games at the time this came out, 1998 or so. And if you look at how history is portrayed in those games, history is portrayed like a real-time strategy game. So what I would say is, instead of saying, like, why did they design the game so that uh, buildings have hit points? What I would say is, how did they take a real-time strategy and look at a historical topic and make all the different parts of history fit a historical strategy game? Oh, well, they gave buildings hit points. Oh, uh, you have to have monks in the Middle Ages because religious figures were really important. But what are they going to do in a real-time strategy game? Oh, I know they'll convert enemy units over to your side, even though that may have nothing to do with what monks actually did. So, so genre has a really important role in that as well. Um, and all of these, uh, you know, Play the Past is a great place to go for these uh, places. Or you can check out my website, Gaming the Past, to see the work I've done. In terms of my mind, in your latest iteration of the historical problem space, which is the big diagram with with the with, with the boxes you can fill it in, that, that that's almost a guide to designing a game. I mean, the game design courses they sometimes talk about uh, uh, game design documents and basic loops and all of that. But I, I, I we, we uh, both uh, the three of us are actually in a team uh, developing a, a board game at the moment, the Triumph of Tarlock. When I saw this uh, that that diagram, I said, you know, maybe we could use that to 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 prototype our ideas to see how they interact with, with one another. That, 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 that's something really interesting. I'm, I'm not sure if you're if you have that application in mind. Uh, the historical problem space is a to to for to help people design historical games, but I, I think it has some some there's something to it. I th I really appreciate that because um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm that's so great. I'm so great. It could uh, I'm so glad it could be helpful. That's you know what what I'm trying to do is come up with a a, a useful th uh, tool for people. Um, I didn't originally intend it that way, but I think I think the reason that it works so well for design, going from the design perspective. And I've even put that, um, I think, in the uh, introduction to the new sort of series I'm writing on this right now. I think I also put this time, I used to just put it was for game educators and game studies folks, but then I put designers as well. Here's what I think it is. I have been a hobbyist computer programmer for I'm 48 now, so 35 years, I don't know, something like that. Um, I, I, I have programmed computers as a hobby and I've never gotten very good at it, but I've always enjoyed it and I appreciate some of the basic challenges of programming. And as I told you, I love games. So to me, game design is, it's just such an amazing profession and, and it's just a great, great thing. So what I was really interested in was having a perspective that, that reflected that game developers are serious, talented individuals who are trying to make a historical game, right? That's what, if they don't want to make a historical game, there's lots of avenues to make non-historical games, but they're not historians, not academic historians. And so I really wanted to look at with this historical problem space for practical purposes, how does it work? Um, but I'm glad you've seen that. I actually found that too, is that the, the, the kind of guide I used to give people about how to make a historical simulation game was very different before I, I came up with this framework. And I think this framework does kind of help out, or at least I'm, I'm glad to hear that because it's meant to think about the designers. And I think that just necessarily translates into, well, okay, I could make a game like this. Um, if you've got those parts, you, you've got a historical game. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. As we've seen today, you have done, as you yourself mentioned, you have, you have done quite a lot of different things throughout the, the, the past few years. So where are you headed next? What, what's the next big thing you're working on? So um, yeah, that's a great question. And so um, a fair amount of my research, um, at, at the end of the day, a lot of my research comes from trying things out as a teacher and trying things in classes. So this fall, I mentioned, I have an interactive history class that's in its 
this might be its third or fourth time I've offered it. I get to offer it once a year as an elective. Um, and I've been refining it as, as I go. And this year, um, we're focusing on imperialism and colonialism and the two world wars, because they're just rich areas for looking at video games. Personally, we're going to have to only look at video games. We face to face with masks, but I can't really be using, you know, game pieces that people are swapping around and things like that. That's just not safe. Um, so I've really increased the number of games that we're going to be looking at. And one of the things that I'm going to uh, do this year is um, have students play a few games, but also do some one day demos where I demo for them a game so that they don't always have to learn how to play it. They don't always have to spend lots and lots of time figuring out the details, but they can have exposure to a bunch of different games. So. What that means for my research is I get to take that historical problem space framework and learn how to teach with it. And that diagram, um, people are uh, of the problem space, people are kind of of mixed opinions of that. Some people say it's too confusing. I think the thing that um, I should always mention to people is I made that diagram so that students could fill it out. So the reason it's designed the way it is and has the big blank spaces is so students could go through and write out who is the agent and what are the elements and things like that. Um, so what I'm going to do um, in this fall course is really test out some more developments on this and see how this uh, problem space developments uh, work. Um, I've got that series on Play of the Past. My, my hope is to do one a month for probably next year, certainly, um, because uh, well, I, I have so many other kind of things going on that it's not really in the works at the moment to do an article on problem spaces. I'd like to get to that at some point. Um, but I'm going to be developing that series, and I would love it. Any and all of you, please come read it and post your ideas. I want to I want to discuss this with people. Um, I'm working on updates to Path of Honors. I got to do a little work on that Twine game uh, and, and revise the code a little bit. Um, um, so that should have an update pretty soon. But those are kind of the big areas. I've got, I've got some articles and some things I'm working on, but those are kind of my big areas. And I get to re run that Roman Republic simulation again uh, this winter. So there's a lot of things. I do a lot of things. But I, you know, I'm passionate about what I do, and I really think that there is a power to the systems and the choices that are built into games that make it an incredible way to think about the past. I want to do a follow-up question as well. Sure. Uh, you, you said that you have a more hands-on approach in terms of developing. So you, you come up with the basics, and then you go drive with your students and go back and forth uh, what would what can we what are the ups and downs of that approach uh, the hindrances and the good sides and how does that development if, if I'm if I understood myself as well and made myself clear as well because the language barrier but I as far as I understood you you of course you create pro the problems or the themes to approach and then you start developing with your student with your students or with a hat with that kind of approach of okay i'm not gonna go start with this and come for for example using us an example we right. take a theme and we do the research on top of it and then we start developing and we do we don't have that back and forth between students or possible uh, 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 students there we are going to uh, address the content so uh, right. that are the, the users of that content so how what are the ups and downs of doing that 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 approach if i understood myself correctly as well yeah no i think i think i didn't speak so much about it i was more talking about with students uh working on some of the game analytical uh pieces like the historical problem space but but i absolutely have on many occasions designed games and got and been in a situation where the kids could play them immediately and I could see um, 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 how it worked. I mean, the the downsides are games break immediately as soon as you play test them. And so you have to be prepared when you're in a classroom uh, um, testing out your game. You have to be prepared, you or the teacher running the class or whatever has to be prepared for what to do when it doesn't work. Um, and so that's, you know, that's sort of, I, I, I don't think that's a downside. I think that's just a challenge to be aware of. The upside is you're getting real 
sort of feedback from your audience. And and one of the things I've come to appreciate over the years is how much teaching students has sort of driven me to be hopefully clear, precise, practical. Um, I'm not really interested in using big words like ontological and things like that when I'm writing about things. I'm interested in things that can be communicated, hopefully, to a 15-year-old if they were really motivated to learn about it. So I think getting to test your game like that, you get to see what works and what and, and what doesn't. And that kind of feedback is just uh, I mean, that's true in commercial game design, too. The ability to get that quick feedback, the ability to prototype, break it, and then go back and do it again and again is invaluable. So, yeah, um, I think the problem, I don't know what Brazil's situation is in the United States. Um, the public education programs uh, are, are pretty strongly controlled by states. And so you have to find a school that has enough flexibility that you could bring your game in. But there are some, there are places that do that. Um, so I would say if you can make a partnership with some teachers to try out your game. Um, and I guess if I, I guess if I were doing it, if I were trying to um, pitch a game to a classroom so that they'd try it and I'd get feedback, I would, I would talk with the teacher about a partnership. And here's the sort of things that I hope they're going to be thinking about, I would say to the teacher. And maybe you can help me think about what kind of resources they might look at so that if the game doesn't work when when you uh, when you run it, you could at least have a conversation on what it was trying to achieve. So I don't know. What, what, what is your game about? What's your game about? Well, we actually, actually, aside from the tabletop that Vinicius has talked. We are doing one about uh, actually from an archaeological site of a sugarcane plantation that is going to be not only to the museum at the site, but also to educational purposes. And we have another one that we already done that is completing it one year that is the shell mounds about uh, an ancient civilization here in Brazil in south and southern, south, south. Ugh, South as and South Brazil that are four thousand three three to four thousand years ago, and they were about the burial rites and the community, the prehistorical community of those sites. So we we we've done we are these are the projects that we've done into on that subject of developing video games and it with the educational purpose. Yeah, so what I would say in that, right, the goal of the game is to put you in the role of an archaeologist, right? You're doing you're doing some kind of dig virtually? Uh, uh, on the shell mount, on the shell mount game, which is the only one we have released on, yeah. on our research group, is actually the whole track from the archaeological knowledge. So we start, you start as an archaeologist, as a woman archaeologist, and then you, you dig the site in the present, then you go, of course, towards the, the past, which is actually cool. the archaeological knowledge that we gather through our consultants that are our peers within the, which are our peers, our colleagues that study the area. And of course, we did a lot of research through articles and books and theses. Right. So that's the knowledge that we took to develop that, that side of the story. And at the end, we have a, a museum which you can interact with the archaeological pieces that we've we actually Alex he's the only one who act within our digital department so to say he's the only one who had that programs really right and unfortunately he couldn't be here to talk with us to talk with you and uh, we end up develop we end up developing that so it's actually more than just this, the the mound people it's right. actually the archaeology of the mound people. And, so and so okay so that's that's enough for me to 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 work with that's that's really helpful so what I, what i would say then is you know if i were trying to get that into a history classroom and, and i was trying to do something in a way that you know a jeremiah mccall teacher might might you know want um what i would what i would say is i think you would go back to the historical problem space model and you'd say who is my agent right and 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 what is it that they're trying to achieve and then i guess what i would do from there is i i would say what 
other materials can be used to gain for for the students to bring some understanding of the Shell Mountain people. Um, is there, you know, is there a, a teenager friendly or, or whatever your age group is, you know, website that describes the Shell Mound people? Could we create an overview? Could we ask a teacher to write one? Uh, it doesn't have to be text. That's just an obvious, you know, a, an obvious form to use. But I would go, I would look at that problem space. I would give them some kind of source they could look at or some kind of lecture notes or something on the other side. And then I would say, how does the, how does the character and the character's goals and the things they're working around fit what we think we know about, uh, about this? So I, I really think that's kind of the way to go if you're gonna, if you're gonna kind of build it beyond just here's the information i mean obviously there's information in there you're hoping that they'll, they'll learn but remember we're not very good your educators we're not very good at getting kids to memorize stuff we do it all the time and we keep knowing that it's just not a very effective way to learn so uh, so what i would say is the deeper learning comes from that critical analysis so i would say okay get them in that space and think about that come up with some systems questions why uh, i'm making stuff up now i know nothing about the shell mound people why did their civilization uh, seem to go and uh, undergo an economic decline uh, what was the role of, uh, you know, shell polishing in the shell mound people's worlds? Uh, you know, are there, and then you talked about a museum, then I would say, I mean, there you might twist it on its head, right? And say like, how would the shell mound people feel about this museum that was being made, you know, representing them? So getting them, getting them to see the game as, a per, a, a, as a representation of people making choices um, um, and interacting. That's that's kind of how I would uh, would approach that. That's fascinating stuff. Well, let me just uh, say some words as you finish the video. Or we'll, we'll, of course, edit all this out afterwards. So Jeremiah, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, I'm pretty sure our audience will appreciate it as well, all their expertise. And I hope this is just the first of many collaborations. Hope to hear from you again. And of course, we'll make sure to check out your work. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you all. And there's nothing I enjoy better than than just batting these ideas around. So anybody watching out there, pretty easy to find me and my work. We'll give you some links that you can look at. And um, let, let's talk about history and games. Thanks so much.